Sock on that, NXP. Hello, folks. It's that time again. Time to see how badly I've screwed up the V1 board for the MG. Shocker. Pretty badly. But still spins on motor. Let's have a look. Alright, so here we have our um, little demo now of the problem. So what I've had to do here is kind of make a little hackery job. It's just an amalgam of a logic board and a breakout board. And that lets me bring on and off the 5 volt logic supply to the... Um, non-isolated side of the gate drivers separately to the 30 volts oscillator base supply that goes to the um, isolated high voltage side so we what we've got here you see we've two two red leds here on the breakout board and if we just bring up the 5 volt supply uh, you'll see they come on and what they're basically telling us is that saying that all of the low side and all of the high side gate drivers are now in a fault state. And if we bring up the isolated supply now, you'll see that these LEDs rem remain on. Now, if we reverse that sequencing, we bring up the isolated supply first and then bring up the logic supply you see both LEDs give a little flick and then they remain out and we can switch on and off the isolated supply as often as we like but here in this normal mode now if we were to switch off the um, let's say the supply on the high voltage side we bring up a latched fault there and that will not clear off unless we bring back up our high voltage supplies and then recycle the logic supply so that's obviously a feature uh, within the gd 3100s um, that basically don't allow them to operate until they've a stabilized supply uh, present on their isolated side and I'm sure that information relating to that is available in the proper full data sheet that we're not allowed to um, access but uh, so yeah the problem here being then that we have our logic board uh, built unfortunately uh, this it means that it it constantly goes into this fault state so we're always in this state here where we have our uh, gate drivers in a fault state and thus um, we can't really operate them unless we monkey around um, and get them back into a running mode now it is entirely feasible that when we have SPI communication working uh, between the STM32 and the gate drivers that even if we've a latched fault like this it'll be possible to read it and then clear it uh, but at the minute I'm not delving into the SPI side yet I just want to get basic functionality uh, working here before we have to start working out how to communicate with these things because of course that's secret information as well <laughs> I mean, it's a gate driver chip, guys. It's not, you know, it's it's not, it's not controlling the hotline or something. But anyway, no point arguing with this stuff. You're just arguing with the devil in the courts of hell. So, seems to be a facet of um, electronics these days. Anyhow, that's where we're at. So, I'm going to have to do little bit of redesign on my logic board shocker uh, just to give me a high side switch so that I can switch on and off the 5 volt 
um, logic side supplies to our gate drivers. But in the in the meantime, I'm going to work away um, and make sure that things like the current sensors are reading properly and uh, well, the high voltage feedback is a little bit weird. I want to try and or the DC bus voltage, I should say. I want to try and have another bit of an examination of that. So okay, so that's our little demo of our problem. Uh, that's kind of consigned the version one board to history. Okay, so in this part, hopefully, you're going to get to see this motor spinning. But because I'm filming this, it probably won't work. Anyway, also in advance, I'd like to apologize if there is a bit of noise um, on the audio because obviously we're not buttoned up here and I'm using a a wired microphone so it's quite possible to be a little bit of uh, PWM noise so all right so what we have here is our V1 logic board connected up uh, to the inverter power stage and you'll see here that we have two red LEDs again as per the same setup that we had on our little breakout board here and they're tied into these they're called int B lines on the gate drivers um, and I'm beginning to suspect uh, that they're not actually really fault indication lines, they're more interrupts. So let's turn on some uh, 12 volt power here to our uh, system and you'll see straight away that we're in trouble here um, that our two fault lights uh, come on here and so to basically frig this now so that we can run it what I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug the ribbon cable and then push it up we didn't get it perfect there we go so I've now reconnected the uh, ribbon cable and we see our two interrupt or fault lights or whatever you want to call them are now out next thing i'm going to do bring up a little bit of uh, voltage on the high voltage bus here i've just got 30 volts dc connected to this guy so now let's see if we can connect my wonderful half dead computer here to the wi-fi network on our logic board uh, connect to that Wi-Fi and can we connect yay and we need to crank up the boost to maximum lots of boost and then we're gonna go uh, start inverter in manual mode and fly down here to spot values we're in manual run then I'm going to put my um, F-slip set point at 5 hertz. Oh, there's some whine. And our 12 volt current has dropped up to 860 milliamps. Now I'm going to start pumping some amplitude into this thing. Oh, my current limit has kicked in. Sorry, folks. I just turn down let's turn down hey there it goes there is our motor spinning spinning away merrily at uh, five hertz now the rather keen-eyed amongst you will observe that our fault lights have came back on well fault lights or interrupt lights have came back on even though we're clearly generating PWM and spinning the motor away merrily here. Now, <clears throat> the best that I can work out here is that something that we're feeding into the PWM here is slightly annoying the super secret gate drivers. And I'm sure that once we establish SPI communication with them, we'll be able to f find out what that is and, you know, clear the fault or whatever it is that we need to do now what we don't want to have happen here and what would happen now with this existing board design 
is if those interrupt lights came on or those interrupt signals fired, it would immediately shut down the PWM from the STM32. So I'm going to have to work out a slightly different circuit here for handling these interrupts because they're not always critical faults. For example here, this could be just a warning. But it's clearly happy uh, to make PWM and spin a motor here. And this is our first motor spin now with the um, MG inverter so I'm quite happy with that obviously this is just a little industrial motor I just use for testing because we've got a we'll be working out like resolver feedback and all that for running the actual MG drive unit but there it is folks <clears throat> and as far as I know we should be able to stop and start that pretty much um, so we can stop inverter there and restart it again uh, without any problems so I'll stop and start here just from the web interface without any problems at all um, and this proves here that we are generating three phase current uh, with our gate driver okay so here we have the oscilloscope waveform here uh, from our what I assumed and still assume is the uh, measurement of the high voltage DC bus mechanism that's used on the gate driver board. And there's a digital isolator and an LM2901 comparator used in this uh, circuit. And this waveform is running at 1 megahertz. And if we change the high voltage DC um level that we apply to the um inverters dc bus the duty cycle of this waveform changes um, really yes it changes quite a bit actually uh, let me go trigger old normal auto trigger and indeed it's not behaving at all uh, now in a way that I would have seen it behave previously. But the great thing is if we hit inverter start, now we get all manner of weird stuff going on here. And you'll see that if I reduce the time base a bit, you'll see something that looks very much like the actual 5 hertz uh, PWM that we're currently feeding into the uh, system here. So somehow I'm missing something in how this high voltage monitoring circuit is operating. If I stop inverter, we come back now to this um, kind of 50% duty one uh, megahertz waveform. And then start inverter again. And we go back to the kind of this kind of a thing here if I can catch it for you so you'll see uh, what we end up with so yes more fun things to be discovered okay so things have escalated just a tiny bit here as you can see I've actually removed the gate driver board uh, from the IGBT brick and the reason for that is I screwed up uh, but it's not all bad news so let's go with the bad news first the bad news is I've successfully blown this gate driver chip and this digital isolator chip so yay me now the good news is that in doing so we have learned quite a bit so that you don't have to blow these chips that's my job now how did we manage it well I was probing around this LM2903 um, dual comparator chip here and it's really tiny and basically I was looking up at the oscilloscope 
I managed to slip the probe and it short circuited two uh, pins. And our power supply made a little hissing sound and then it wasn't particularly happy. And this gate driver here would then get warm uh, whenever the isolated power supply was turned on. And it would uh, generate PWM on five, uh, but this guy here just would not generate PWM. It was just keeping the gate turned off. So, did some investigation. And that revealed quite a bit here to us. So, these super secret gate driver chips um, have a, on their isolated side, the little regulator circuit here that takes in the 18 volt positive supply and makes an internal 5 volt supply to run the isolated uh, logic. There's a version of that available on this pin here. Uh, that can supply 5 volts at up to 20 milliamps. So what our friends here, sadly not our friends in Longbridge, but someplace else, uh, they took that 5 volt supply and they used it to supply 5 volts to the 2 pi semi digital isolator chips, isolated side, and also the LM2903 comparator. Now, that's very interesting. So when I um, did my little flick here, I thought I had simply, you know, short circuited this supply a little bit, but turns out, however I managed it, I managed to blow the, um, let's call it the input side of this two pi semi um, isolator chip. This basically crowbarred the this little five volt rail here that this chip generates short circuited the regulator so you would think then that well if we you know disconnect whatever was causing the short circuit that this would then come back to life well sadly not uh, it's dead on its isolated side the uh, five volt regulator has gone crazy and cooked all of the logic. Good news is it has not actually caused any harm to the IGBT. So I guess the engineers must have been too busy uh, working on the NDA uh, to put a little current limiting function on this output pin here for ham-fisted sods like me. So what else did we learn? Well, Interestingly, during all of this destruction, we discovered that none of this circuitry here is actually related to, um, from what I can tell, reading the high voltage um, DC bus. Instead, the, this little resistor network here, the output from this is, is quite simply fed into an analog input on the isolated side of this, uh, we call this number three low side uh, driver chip. And that is then encoded in here, passed across the isolation barrier, and is available both as an analog output on one of these pins here, which of course we don't use, because bah. Instead, it's also available over SPI as digital data. So long story short, they're reading the high voltage bus voltage with this um, number three low side uh, driver chip and making that available over SPI. So we'll actually be reading the high voltage bus over SPI. That simplifies the logic board for us a little bit. So I'm still trying to work out what all this nonsense does here. Um, I've ordered another one of these chips, uh, gate driver chips from Farnell, and I think I'm gonna have to get this two pi semi part from LCSC, because there doesn't seem to be any other supplier uh, for it. But before we do that anyway, I'll take the part off and we'll be able to um, connect up the OEM 
logic board and do a little bit more investigation in here and see what we can figure out. Uh, so basically what we can tell so far is that they used the uh, high side chips, the analog input on the um, isolated side of the high side chips to read the three temperature sensors. They used the number three low side chip analog input to read the um, high voltage DC. So what this isolator is for and what this comparator is for are still kind of open for interpretation. One of the reasons I took the board off was I wanted to see on the back of it in case there was something like a, a heavy resistor network on here for DC bus discharge or some other scenario that might have um, explained the use of that digital isolator and comparator. So, really birds? So, yeah, nothing jumping out as yet in terms of this stuff, but we have learned quite a bit. Okay, so done a bit more probing around here on this, don't know what you want to call it, voltage monitoring uh, feedback circuit here. I think, to be honest, I'm probably going to break away from this now because I've got to wait for the gate driver chip to come in anyway, which, of course, Farnell's next day delivery uh, is a thing of the past, thanks to the old Brexit. So it'll be next week if I'm lucky. So you'll have to wait for next episode uh, to see me replace this guy. So what I've discovered so far here is we have two strings of these uh, voltage monitoring resistors. The top part of the string is both 230K. The bottom half of the string on this part is 3.1. And the bottom part of the string here is 5k. Now they take the um, joint part here from the 5k through a, a 1k and a 0.1 cap and they bring that straight into the aux in pin. On the low side uh, number three gate driver here so they're using this string here to directly measure the high voltage bus and feed that into the analog, the auxiliary analog to digital input on this gate driver, and then making the uh, reading from that available through the SPI. So I think, to be honest, we're going to be just using that SPI data here from this chip uh, to measure our high voltage bus. I'll keep working on this kind of passively. Um, but uh, yeah, that's about what I've figured out for now. There's not a lot, not a lot goes on on the back of this board. It's just predictably little caps and diodes and things like that. But it's a nice design. I like it. Um, the only thing I severely dislike is the attitude of NXP with these GD3100 gate drivers. Um, but all it really means is it's just more work to reverse engineer the SPI protocol and uh, be able to configure the drivers and then read. Uh, so we're going to be reading the high voltage DC bus from this guy here and then the three temperature sensors uh, through the auxiliary in on the high side drivers here. Panzer interlude. Doesn't really warrant a video by itself, so I'll just randomly stick it in here in the middle of a reverse engineering one. Um, so as you can see, our left front wheel, we've removed the front control arms and track rod end, because Mr. NCT uh, decided that he didn't like one of those three things. So, According to the enigmatic Mr. NCT, uh, this joint here is shot, apparently. Um, would have to kind of 
agree it is pretty loose so fair enough according to same mr nct this one's fine he said to me really not so much this is apparently shot as well and considering it doesn't uh, move anymore and this one here is really floppy yeah i'd have to agree with that so pretty straightforward bit of replacement you might say now you'd be right managed to get the track rod locally that was no problem they had that for me uh next day now, this is our new track rod oh shiny but despite both of the other arms actual control arms being available from aftermarket suppliers computer said no so i had to get these from germany and that resulted in a whole dose of courier nonsense with wrong addresses and all kinds of fun packed stuff but anyway that's now in the past we go ahead and get these parts on and there it is all in um new control arms and track rod end and we have no play in that whatsoever now it's all the old junk there um just paint by numbers so i'm going to get the wheel back on get the weight on the wheel um tighten up the bushings we can call this part done okay folks so there you have it z1 board doesn't work shocker but we weren't really expecting that to be the case. Uh, I'd made a lot of assumptions about how certain facets of the uh, drivers uh, worked here. So we're going to be working on the V2 board uh, with the lessons learned here and the necessary changes. And we'll be back hopefully in a few weeks uh, with another board and um, hopefully get a little bit further down the road but i am quite excited about this mg inverter project and well drive unit project because it's a really neat unit uh lends itself to an easy board replacement option and uh, it'll hopefully provide another drivetrain choice for people to consider so i won't uh bore you with any more boredom uh only to say we'll see you in the next episode don't forget to give all this nonsense a solid dislike and a thumbs down and don't share it with your friends share a cat video with your friends instead they'll be much more friendly towards you also be sure to check the links in the description for open inverter forum and github and so on while carefully avoiding those ones for financially supporting me such as patreon and paypal and those don't do that because this is what i do with your with your money i waste it on stupid designs that don't work <laughs> anyway that's enough for now enough out of me i will go back to work and we'll um see you next time and until then happy two pie semi replacing